Well, howdy. howdy. As Sarah said, I have a diverse educational background, engineering degree, JD, PhD. Some of you may be wondering, what does this kid want to be when he grows up? And I'll let you know when I get there. I'm going to talk today about copyright. Copyright attorney, copyright scholar is what I am right now. And basically all of my training from engineering to law to economics is about problem solving. And so for me when I talk about copyright, what I want to know is does it work? Is it solving the problem it's meant to solve? And uh, while this title is not very informative, right, the point I want to drive home, the idea I want to convey is that copyright system as we have it today is fundamentally broken. Uh, the idea of copyright is that we prohibit people from making copies so that you have to buy an authorized copy instead of getting one from your friend and that makes the author or the artist or the copyright owner earn a little more, more money from each book or song or whatever it is that they've created and so we get more, more works of authorship, more books, more movies, more novels, all that stuff. We get more of it and that's good for society. But what I've found is that more copyright, uh, it does give them more money but it's less works of authorship. And in particular, I'm going to focus on the music industry over the last 50, 60 years. So the purpose of copyright is enshrined in the Constitution in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, which authorizes Congress to enact copyright to promote the progress of science, not to enrich authors or copyright owners, but to give us more, more music, more mo movies, more books. And so the idea here is that because some people are going to free ride, they're not going to pay for their copies, we're going to get an underproduction, il illustrated here by the shortfall in production from Q to Q prime. Instead of having the actual demand, we actually have some people who are file sharing. I know none of you file share, but maybe you have some friends that have done it. And so the author is not getting really the full price for the novel they've written or the song they've created. And so copyright fixes that problem by prohibiting copying and thereby sort of makes everyone pay for the music, for example, that they get access to. And as a result, we push the production up to where it's supposed to be and we get this public benefit, the progress of science. We get more music, for example, if that's the work of authorship we're going to focus on as it is here. Um, the other thing copyright does, though, it doesn't just prohibit copying for those marginal works, those additional works that are not otherwise profitable. It also prohibits copying for the whole range of music we would have gotten even without copyright or with somewhat shorter or narrower copyright. And that's what I call copyright success. And the traditional analysis of this is that this success is not really a big problem. It means music may be a little more expensive and so we're balancing sort of the higher price and the shortfall in access against the incentives for additional works. But it's really just an assumption. And so we assume that more incentives is going to be more music. And we've assumed this for 400 years. And over that 400 years, copyright has gone from a very short term, 14 years, to a very long term today, life plus 70 years of the author. It's gone from a fairly narrow scope against really mechanical copying to a much broader scope, including derivative works such as making a film from a novel, as well as public performances on radio stations or other forms, uh, Spotify or Pandora. But we really don't, haven't tested these assumptions. Now, if we wanted to do it ideally, the economist in, in me would say, well, you take four different worlds that are otherwise identical and you say no copyright here, uh, limited copyright here, much more copyright here, and really complete copyright here, and we'll see how the four worlds do over time. But we don't really have the technology to do that, so we have to look for natural experiments. That is, situations where technology or the law changes and we get some variation in copyright protection. And so, of course, the example we've all been focused on here is file sharing. I'm sure, again, none of you have done this, but you may know friends who have done it or heard of it. Right? But it allows you to share your music files with a, someone else who has the same program, whether it's Napster or one of the others. And you see the list of the files that are available, you just click on it, suddenly you have a copy on your computer. Now, of course, the copyright owners, including the music industry, were not happy about file sharing, and so they've sued all of these uh, file sharing services out of existence. They've even sued private consumers for file sharing. And, of course, that lawsuit campaign's been very successful. You can see, oh, well, maybe not. So the lawsuit campaign's been going on since before 2000, uh, started really in 2000 itself against Napster. And this is file sharing traffic in North America in petabytes per month. And you can see we're up about 1,000 petabytes per month last year, 2016. That's what Cisco estimates. 
which is about 1.25 billion CD quality albums of music a year being file shared in North America, if it's all music uh, and CD quality. So there's still a lot of file sharing going on. Um, and if we put that in our traditional balance of incentives versus access, right, there's good. People are getting a lot more music. And when I testified to Congress about this issue, I said file sharing has put more music in the hands of more Americans than any invention since the phonograph. And you can see from the blue here, this is all the file sharing. If all that file sharing traffic were music, we'd be up over 12 billion albums a year, whereas the most we ever got distributed in the market was here in 1999, 2000, about a billion albums a year. So file sharing radically increases exact access to existing music. Our concern, of course, is that it interferes with the incentives for the creation of new music because people are file sharing to get their music instead of going to Blockbuster or your favorite record store. Record stores don't exist anymore, right? They're all gone. Uh, and so file, the, the revenue from music sales, record sales, has gone from $20 billion in 1999. That's in current dollars. These are all constant dollars I'm using so we can compare them. All the way down to under $7 billion in 2013. That's about that still last year in 2016 as well. So we're worried that this decline in revenue, if copyright's premise that more revenue means more music, if that's right, and it's been right, or we've assumed it's right for 400 years, then we should see a sharp downfall in music. So then the question comes, well, how do you measure music output? And there are a number of techniques you might use. So the simplest is go to SoundScan and ask them how many albums were released in the United States each year. And they'll give you something that looks like this, starting, they only go back to 1996. Um, so we don't have data back for all the time we'd like to look at, but back to 1996, it was about 30 to 40,000 albums a year in the late 90s. It sort of drifted down for a little bit, but then it really took off and got up over 100,000 albums in 2008, and then with the Great Recession sort of tailed down. But still, 2012 and today, last year, it's 80,000 albums, twice what we had at the peak revenue period of 1999. But maybe they're all bad albums or you know, it's hard to know what this really means on its own. Maybe there's new technology. Maybe YouTube is letting us discover more Justin Bieber's, and so we're getting more music out. Uh, we just don't know. So uh, what if we took the whole music revenue for the whole rock era, right, all the way back to 1960, and put it again in constant dollars, so it's starting below $5 billion, climbing to the peak in 1999 of $20 billion, and then falling down. Now, that's a great test. If copyright's right, and we're going to get more and better music because of this money, we're giving them a bunch of money. How much money? We're giving them $332 billion to the record industry, so they better give us something in return, right? Even if we just took a line here from the 90s, right, up through the 90s, it was about $100 billion. So in terms of constant dollars, what costs similar? Well, the Apollo 11 moon landing, <laughs> or the Marshall Plan. We could rebuild Europe after World War II. Uh, so what sort of music are we getting for this? Well, when you think about it, so what sort of charts or data do we have on music output over the last 50, 60 years? Well, we had the Hot 100 chart. Every week, 52 weeks, we get a Hot 100 chart from Billboard. So we can go back, and that goes all the way back into the 50s. And it turns out most of the songs on the Billboard Hot 100 chart are repeat. Same songs week to week, over and over again. What do you know? We like to listen to the same thing. Uh, but we can count the number of new or unique songs on the chart. You can see it peaked here in the late 60s, early 70s. Out of the 5,200 slots, 743 was the peak we reached. And then as revenue went up, right, so our revenue chart's going up to 1999 and then falling down. So as revenue's going up, the number of unique songs that are good enough to compete for a slot on the Hot 100 are falling. And they fall all the way down here to 2001, and then they start kicking up again. Well, that's right when the revenue started falling. So what's going on there? OK, so that's one p bit of data. And of course, just like the albums fell off in the Great Recession, we see the turnover fell over in the Great Recession as well. So that seems to be real. Well, we can look at uh, reviewers of music. And so Rolling Stone magazine puts out a list of the top 500 albums of all time. And we can group them by the year they were released. And it turns out, just like the turnover peaked in the late 60s, early 70s, turnover, uh, the best rock albums, according to Rolling Stone, 
Also early 70s and then sort of steady fall. Again, as revenue's going up, we don't seem to be getting the best rock albums at least, at least not according to Rolling Stone magazine. They're a bunch of old white guys though. What do they really know about music? Have any other data? Well, the young and the hip are using Spotify. So we could ask them what good music is and look at what they actually stream on Spotify. So this is worldwide streams, again, organized by year, for the top 1,000 songs from 1960 to 2005. The number of times they were streamed worldwide on Spotify uh, in 2014. Now you can see there's a very clear time trend, preference for newer music, maybe a younger skewing population using Spotify. So let's take that time trend out and see which years were actually better than we would expect and worse. And this is what we get once we do the econometric work on that. So the good years are years where we got uh, more plays than expected. And so we get a positive normalized play count. So the late, seven, late 60s, early 70s, that's three pieces of data that all agree on that. Uh, as it turns out, 83 was a very good year. And as it turned out, that was one of the low years on the revenue. The 90s, when we're pouring these hundreds of billions of dollars into the music industry, well, frankly, they sucked. At least in terms of the music people want to listen to today, and we do see file sharing and revenues start to fall, and all of a sudden they start to pick up again. And so we see this sort of consistent pattern. Now, the 60s, some of the data here is uh, not quite sure what's going on there. The Beatles were not on Spotify in 2014, so that may be it all by itself. Now, Taylor Swift was not on Spotify in 2014, but her first hit is 2006, so we don't have to worry about the Taylor effect, which you always have to consider when you're doing analysis of music. I don't want her to sing a song about me. It would undoubtedly be bad, or I would be bad. Okay, so let's go back to the Billboard Hot 100 chart and see if we can make any better sense of this. Uh, so we have two types of entries. These unique songs are either by a new artist so their first hit on the Billboard Hot 100. And this is what it looks like. Pretty steady. We had the most new artists in the 60s. And this is one of the troubles of doing this type of natural experiment. Does this mean we should reinvade Vietnam and we'd get another peace movement and more music? Um, and you just can't account for factors, cultural factors of that sort that may be causing those problems. But since then, it's been pretty much downhill. Now, there does seem to be a flattening right here in the 90s. And if we put it in terms of percentage of unique songs by new artists, you can see part of what that $100 million billion was going to was investing in new artists. Of course, most of them turned out to be busts, right? They'd have one billboard hit on average. Um, they'd have one billboard hit, and then they'd be done 50% of the time. Uh, we're seeing an even steeper fall, though, in existing artists. So our existing artists, those the second or third hit on the Billboard Hot 100, they're not putting out as many hits. And so the question really is why? And of course, what you need to realize, so if we take those uh, same Spotify top 1,000 hits and we just put them in order from the top song, any guesses? Top song from 2005 and before? Eminem, Lose Yourself? Down to the number 1,000 song, any guesses? You'll never guess it. The Goo Goo Dolls, Your Name. Right? Uh, it's very highly skewed. So when we give that $100 billion to the music industry in the 90s, most of it goes, 90% of it goes to the, two, the top artists, right? If we use a system like copyright that's uniform, gives the same protection to everybody, to give $1 here to the Goo Goo Dolls, we have to give 12 to M&M. Uh, and sure, we're you know, giving a lot of money to M&Ms, so that's part of my life goal. Uh, but it may not really be helpful in terms of copyright. And of course, this is only part of the data. Right? This is only the most popular song from 2005. If we extended this chart up to the most popular song, that would be Drake, One Dance, over a billion streams. And the Goo Goo Dolls are not actually the worst song on Spotify, actually the 25 million songs on Spotify. Four million have never been streamed at all. No one's ever listened to them, not even once. So go out and listen to one of those songs today. But the average song only gets listened to about 15,000 times a year. So to give one of those average songs $1, we have to give Drake $66,666.66. And I'm sure it's just a coincidence that it happens to be the number of the beast. I don't know. <laughs> but what we end up doing is giving all, these money, all this money to our very top artists. And so what do they do? So you're 20, you're extremely popular with the opposite sex, and I give you $20 million. 
Are you going to show up to work tomorrow? Or are you going to go to Miami? Maybe rent a Lamborghini. Get a little drunk at a party. Get arrested. Tell the cop, don't you know who I am? He says, no. Get a petition started at the White House to have you evicted from the country because you're from Canada. <laughs> well, that's what Justin Bieber did, right? And I think that's what our artists are doing. And so we economists talk about this as the backward bending labor supply curve, right? Sure, if I pay you $10 an hour, you'll work 20 hours a week. Pay you 100, you'll work harder. Pay you 1,000, you work harder. 10,000, you say, wait a minute. I got enough money in the bank. I need to take a little time off for myself. And if I was paying you a million dollars an hour, how many hours are you going to work each week? Maybe one, half, 10 minutes? I don't know. I wouldn't work that much if I was making a million dollars an hour. So do we have any data to back this up? This notion that we pay our top artists, copyright ensures a system that the top artists earn so much money, it's really not worth showing up to work the next day. And so here's the top 250 artists of all time in terms of record sales, and the number of studio albums they released in the first 10 years of their career on the y-axis by the year uh, of the first album release. And so we average about 14 albums per year for the best-selling acts in the early 60s, down to eight and a half, down to seven and a half, down to five. So they're getting better technology, and it's taking them longer to release their albums. Something weird's going on here. Right? We can look at the top artists of each year from 1962 to the present, well, 2006, because we've got to have a 10-year time frame for the release of the number of Billboard albums. Who's number one? Way up there. That would be the Beatles. Number two? There's Taylor Swift. <laughs> if only she had had eight more breakups, she probably could have gotten up <laughs> to squeeze those in. No. Didn't work out. So here they are, the top Billboard artists, most hits in the first 10 years of your career. And look, they're all either in the early 60s or in the 2004 and thereafter period. They're all in the low revenue periods when they actually have to work at least a little bit for the money they're getting. So that's pretty much all I have. And the basic point here is copyright. We have a problem. You're not doing what you're supposed to do. Instead of encouraging more marginal works and making sure we don't have a shortfall in copyright production, you're enriching the people at the very top, and you're enriching them so much that they are not producing the works we would like them to produce. What if Mozart or Shakespeare had been paid in this fashion and only written half of the works that we have from them? What if the Beatles had stopped after their sixth album and we never got Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band? So we need to prevent uh, further expansion of copyright Talked about testifying before Congress. Copyright owners are always there, always trying to get more protection. We need to reform the copyright systems so that it does what it's supposed to do. And if we can't, we probably should abolish it. But this is all up to you, right? You are the people who elect representatives who make these decisions. So be involved, make a difference. And that's my idea worth sharing. Thank you. <laughs>